Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another broadcast from Grant's Interest Rate Observer Radio. Uh, with me today is uh, is the great Evan Lorenz, the deputy editor of Grant's, and uh, Eric Whitehead, the engineering officer at the controls, and I am Jim Grant, and we are here to talk about, I don't know, what do you, what do you think of an interest rates, I guess, as, as timely as they get these days, and we have some other topics as well. Uh, but first, a word from um, the inevitable, the sponsor, which happens to be Grant's. Now, um, have you ever set out to clean the attic, but settled down instead to read that pile of old National Geographic magazines, which you had actually intended to dust? Well, someone else can clean the attic. You will have had 90 minutes of discovery. You know, Grants has an archive too. Our archival attic doesn't need cleaning, but it's supremely well stocked. Subscribers may roam at will among 33 and one half years. Yes, 33 and a half years. Oh, 34 years. Who's let's round it up? Worth of. Uh, I must say, fabulous financial commentary, reporting, and information. Nearly 4 million words worth, the equivalent of, what, the, the 40 full-length books, nonfiction, of course. Uh, so do subscribe to Grants. Uh, we're out every two weeks. Uh, you need us. We need you. And there are those 4 million words waiting for you some happy Saturday afternoon. So, Evan, um, it appears as if the Fed were intent upon going through with its uh, announced program of, of raising its little tiny funds rate. It did so Wednesday, and it uh, means to have us believe it will do one more before the year is out. And then it will allow its distended, even one might say grotesque balance sheet to shrink down to somewhat less abnormal size. It's now, what, four and a half trillion almost? And they mean to have it run off by a few billion dollars a month to start, then a few billion more per month after things get normalized. That's the plan. You know, um, sometimes uh, these things don't go according to plan. I'm reminded of uh, cycles past, previous Fed tightening cycles past. And, um, you know, Evan, when you compare the prospect for some monetary tightening this time with what actually happened in years gone by, you are struck by several singular differences of perhaps uh, unique features of the present day. One is uh, simply how slow things move in the present millennial age. God, you'd think that human progress would carry us forward, hurtling forward, but no, the, uh, the nominal GDP, that is GDP not adjusted for inflation, is slogging along at uh, rates uh, almost uh, the lowest in, what, two generations. Uh, a fact checker might correct me on that, but I think this is the slowest rate of growth in nominal GDP in any recent Fed tightening cycle. And then to the Fed, to, for whatever reasons it might have, insist upon at least striving to to create a rate of inflation as measured, uh, say, 2% a year. And it's not 2% a year, it's a little bit less. And this morning brings news that uh, uh, that Amazon, which I thought was in the book business, is going to buy Whole Foods. For what? A jillion dollars or something. Uh, extraordinary. Right? Evan's going to talk about that in a moment. But that certainly is going to intensify what appears to be an all-out war in the grocery world. Um, war is uh, has an unhappy connotation. Um, and I guess for some companies, to judge by stock price action as we speak on Friday, uh, the prospects are not so hot. But for the consumer, wow, you know, low prices, pretty good. So the Fed uh, professes to be driven by data. You know, it, it wants full employment uh, as measured uh, by the data. It wants price stability as they define it by the data. And yet the data are looking rather squishy, and the Fed nonetheless uh, has announced its determination to proceed with, with the plan. Uh, you know, there were uh, uh, four recent occasions in which the set, Fed set out to uh, tighten, that is to say, to raise its federal funds rate. Those years were 1988, 1994, 1999, and 2004. The burden of debt, as measured by the ratio of non-financial debt to the GDP, was about 187 or 88 percent thereabouts in the first three instances, 1988, 94, and 99. Uh, then comes the housing bubble, then comes the great uh, mortgage bacchanalia, and by 2004, the ratio of non-financial debt to GDP was about 213%. And wouldn't you know it that today, uh, almost a decade after our sorrows of 2008, that ratio is uh, ballooned to 250%, 250. 
Now, debt is a is a, is an inhibitor. It is a it's the dead hand uh, on production. Uh, nothing wrong with it in moderation, but in excess, it uh, it is a kind of molasses in the gearbox of uh, of enterprise. So this is one of the headwinds, as they say, against uh, this cycle. Uh, our friends at Hoisington Investment Management uh, point out that um, uh, the business debt has set a record. Some people will say, well, a lot of this increment of, of debt growth has to do with the federal borrowing, and it's not so potent or not, not so poisonous uh, to, uh, to growth as private sector encumbrance would be. But private business debt, too, is setting records. So, uh, so it, it seems to me that the, the Fed is, is being dogmatic rather than empirical. It, it wants us to know that it will forever be dependent upon the data and not on preconception. That's one way to proceed, I suppose. But I think, and Evan, you can correct me if you think I'm wrong, but uh, don't just yet. Wait a few minutes. I think the Fed is, uh, is, uh, is on a mission rather than uh, on uh, the mission of uh, referencing statistics. Now, um, bad things have tended to happen in the wake of uh, Fed tightening campaigns. If you go back to uh, 19... 88. Uh, what followed in 1989 was uh, uh, mortgage troubles, commercial mortgage troubles in that cycle, and uh, the junk bond and SNL crack up, savings and loan crack up of 18, 1989 and 90. Uh, if memory serves, which it so infrequently does, there was a recession, a small one, ended in 1991. 1994 was a tightening cycle having to do with. Uh, a little inflation scare, and uh, the Fed was not so uh, transparent as it has become now. And there was a huge jolt of the bond market in 1994. Uh, five years later, 1999, well, that was the tail end of the, the great tech levitation. My goodness, what a cycle that was. The Fed uh, more or less cleared its throat, not a big increase in the funds rate, uh, one can't be sure about cause and effect, but what followed 1999 was the year 2000 and the peak in the NASDAQ stock market. And, uh, well, and then what came was uh, somebody's bright idea to instigate a boom in housing finance to compensate for the deflated boom in technology. So to be sure, the year 2008 did not follow imminently upon the tightening cycle beginning in mid-2004, uh, but uh, the ever higher Fed's funds rate certainly helped to precipitate the manifestation of the debt pro troubles, which were always latent in the mid-2000s, and they became manifest indeed by 2007, 2008. So all this is by way of windy preface to the proposition that a tightening cycle, no, no matter how seemingly benign or inconsequential, 25 basis points, one quarter of a percent at a time. Well, the consequence of that can be, in fact, outsize. But Evan, I've, 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 I'm getting laryngitis from my uninterrupted monologue. I want you to tell us, because you have been a very close student of the, of the retailing world and of the food retailing world in particular, and uh, even more particularly, of, uh, of Kraft Heinz. Tell us about this astonishing, to me, astonishing news this morning about Amazon going out and buying Whole Foods. Yeah, it, it shocked not just me, but the market. If you look at the share prices of Kroger, Target, and a lot of other retailers, they're down 10% plus today uh, on the news. The competition in grocery is intense and is actually getting more intense. You have um, the German discount retailers, um, Aldi, who is already present in the US, spending multi-billions of dollars to you know build more stores. You have Little, which is another discount retailer, starting to build its first stores now, and it, it plans to have about 200 stores in the next 18 months or so. At the same time, Amazon's making major forays uh, into grocery even before its acquisition of, uh, of Whole Foods today. All of this has led to intense price competition. Reuters and Wall Street Journal have been reporting that Walmart's been sitting down with its suppliers, including Kraft Heinz. Kraft Heinz actually gets about 22% of its sales from Walmart, saying, we expect to be lower priced than our competitors 85% of the time, and you're going to get us there. With uh, Amazon's purchase of Whole Foods, Amazon is actually able to do some interesting things. It can actually do grocery pickup. You can order online. It could actually um, help it do grocery delivery because now it has, I think, 
Whole Foods has around 250 stores, but 250 locations to actually ship groceries out around the country of fresh produce. This is all to say that what had been an intense grocery price war is set to get worse. From from the consumer's point of view, better, right? Absolutely better. And this is this is going to weigh on the consumer price index and what a man from Mars or, or might might uh, might assume is is a good way, right? Because it, uh, who wants to pay more for uh, for groceries? I guess the grocery companies want you to pay more, but uh, and perhaps the Fed wants that in service of a rising two percent ideal CPI target, or whatever they're shooting for. Well, they're shooting for inflation for the sake of inflation. On Wednesday, among other things, Yellen complained that um, um, mobile telephony is actually driving down inflation. So the fact that you're paying a little bit less on your uh, cell phone bill apparently is a is a problem for the Fed. It's a problem, yeah. Uh, most uh, Americans might disagree with it. But, you know, um, we at Grants are fond of invoking the uh, the hoary cliche. I guess it's, a, it's actually a, a lyric to a song. The knee bone is connected to the thigh bone. So... Uh, the uh, the Fed's program of uh, of imposing a rate of inflation of two percent a year is connected certainly analytically to uh, the uh, financial world in which Amazon can fund itself on the cheap, in which retail grocery companies can expand. What was the name of the a uh, uh, Fairway? Fairway, yes. Tell us, remind us about uh, how Fairway was able to play the debt markets to continue to expand and thereby to contribute to the sagging prices for food that the Fed bewails. So I think Fairway went public in 2010 or 2011. In the ensuing five years, it lost money every single year. Went bankrupt last year. Uh, in bankruptcy, shut down a store, was brought out of bankruptcy, and actually opened up a new store. So uh, a company that had never actually made a profit, was able to finance itself for five years before you know, calling it quits. And once in bankruptcy protection, was able to find financing to bring itself outside of bankruptcy and open a new store again. Right. So uh, this is not creative destruction. This is, uh, this is prolongation of, of, a, of, a, of a, for a consumer, a very happy stability. But insofar as this is indicative of things happening elsewhere in the economy, it's an, it's an indication, I guess, of, uh, of uh, I don't know, it's kind of a Japanese thing, you know, with the, with the, the dead wood never falling to earth, but uh, remaining where it is and uh, contributing to, you know, I, I hear myself becoming less coherent as I proceed, so I'm going to stop talking, Evan. But we, I, I launched into this by saying that uh, knee bones and thigh bones are connected, that, uh, that seemingly... Um, unconnected or or remote events may in fact bear one on the other, which brings us to China, a country a long way away, big country, a lot of people far away. But in this world of integrated global finance, nothing is that far away. And this week we had uh, news from a Chinese insurance company that somehow or other bears on fairway Kraft Heinz and the Federal Reserve. Tell us, Evan, how this might be so. So Onbang is um, a private Chinese insurance company, um, although calling it insurance is kind of a misnomer. What, what they really sell instead of um, policies to protect you from risk is um, basically investment products by another name. So they, they, they sell these policies that offer high returns to uh, Chinese investors. And with the proceeds, they go off and buy things like Waldorf Astoria, uh, 717 Fifth Avenue, Strategic Hotels and Resorts, a hotel chain that includes uh, San Francisco's uh, West and St. Francis. They've bought a couple of small banks in Belgium. What we found out this week was after the uh, chairman of the company had been under house arrest, he's now been officially detained and uh, been basically kicked out of the company. Chinese regulators have basically forbidden the company from selling a lot of its investment products and forbidden uh, Chinese banks from actually uh, funding the company or selling products through, um, uh, or letting unbanked sell products through those banks. So basically, it's cut adrift. The, the problem- This is no small thing. Anbank is a, is a big enterprise, no? It's a big enterprise. Uh, it, it's also a big shareholder in a lot of other Chinese uh, financials and uh, real estate companies who are also going down. The problem it has right now is th this is in the midst of a great tightening in China's financial uh, system. Starting in August, the PBOC tried to gently nudge rates up. Their yield curve inverted. So right now, the 10-year uh, Chinese government bond actually yields less than the one-year Chinese government bond. There's been incredible stress. And at the same time, they, they've basically cut adrift 
this one company that needs to keep going to um, Chinese investors to to fund itself because these policies do mature. These are wealth management products, so-called, no? Well, it, it, it's insurance, but it, it, it's insurance that's basically an investment-linked product. But these do mature over time, and their assets are often overseas or in the Chinese stock market. So they're funding um, kind of long-term assets with very short-term policies, and they've now been forbidden to basically sell them. Well, Evan, I think we can agree that in this day and age, uh, as no man is an island, so no financial system is isolated. And uh, I dare say we'll be hearing more from Ann Bang from China, uh, more from, uh, I don't know, I guess more from Kraft Heinz, and certainly more from the Federal Reserve. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for listening. I'm Jim Grant, and you've been listening to Evan Lorenz and me, and you've been uh, treated to the engineering prowess of Eric Whitehead at the dials. So please do join us again next week. I think we'll be having a uh, one fine financial analyst named Jim Bianco, a long time friend of this publication and uh, a substantial citizen in the city of Chicago. He's going to be joining us by phone for next week to talk about markets. So ladies and gentlemen, once more, thank you for listening. And we'll talk to you next time from Grant's Interest Rate Observer.